Hello and welcome to CX Today. My name is Charlie and today I'm delighted to be joined by Julian Herzog, Head of Sales at Babel Force. Julian, thanks very much for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm very good. Thanks, Charlie. Um, it's a little snowy out there. I'm in Munich and I think people have seen in the news um, how, how uh, hard it hit us on the weekend. But hey, everything is great. I'm uh, warm and cozy and Charlie, thanks for having me today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, all the snow is gone here. We did have a Sunday of snow um, here in Belgium, but it's very much gone now, depressingly. But it was nice, uh, nice before the Christmas season anyway. And I should quickly also start this by congratulating you uh, for scooping the top prize at the Service Summit's uh, Masterclass uh, Awards. And uh, you did that after kind of a presentation that uh, focused on six forces uh, shaping CX. And I thought that would be kind of a great basis uh, for this discussion, and we can maybe touch on each of those uh, six forces. Um, so let's maybe start with the first one, uh, and that is market pressure. What can you tell us? Uh, what can you tell us about this force? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so basically, market pressure is the elephant in the room no one wants to talk about at the moment, right? I think we we're, we're so spoiled in tech and people handling tech or vendors that um, we've we've came from a period of ten years of like constant growth, hyper growth, even at times, right? And now we have wars and the world isn't turning to a better and um, the economic situation is problematic. And uh, we, we don't want to talk about it, you know, like my, my entire presentation and, and thanks for congratulating me again. It's, it's been, it's been actually absolutely right to prepare it and go through with it. But my entire presentation is based around the fact that we have to be honest with ourselves about these six forces, right? And market pressure might be one of the most important ones to be honest about. You know, no one will care in the outside world if um, you don't deliver your goods and customer service because you're under pressure as a company. The customer, the paying customer clearly doesn't care. So um, it's really important that, that you anticipate, okay, yeah, we do have variables that have shifted and we now have to figure out how we can create great experiences, even though we're under financial pressure, under market pressure, even though sales aren't going that well. You know, like a company has to adapt before it dies. And I think being honest to yourself about that one factor in, in first is really, really crucial. Hmm. And I think that's particularly interesting because alongside this rising market pressure, you also have increasing customer expectations and consumer expectations. That's your second trend too, and they sort of counterbalance um, one another. Maybe, maybe could you speak to a little bit uh, as well to kind of those increasing consumer expectations? Yeah, of course. I mean, I always say thank you, Amazon, and thank you, Uber, for ruining it for everyone uh, in customer service these days, um, because they set the benchmark, right? Those huge conglomerates with unlimited resources have taken problems in the past and created opportunities from it, and that led to a world where we as an app first generation, as a, as a smartphone first generation, are so spoiled by great customer service experiences that counterintuitively, we set those as our new benchmark for the market. And if someone fails to then deliver that, that's already a bad experience. So the expectations have exponentially risen above the ground level compared to where we are in, in our media and right? Like the, the mid experience is actually pretty shitty compared to the top, top, top tier experience. And uh, the top, top tier experience obviously will influence people, society to take that as your new benchmark and be super unhappy with anything in between. So it's, it's really, it's really a struggle companies have to adapt to. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting. As you say, you have those leaders like um, Amazon just kind of launching forwards and you have everybody else is sort of desperately trying to uh, keep up with them and a few are kind of dropping off um, at the back too. It's, it's um, yeah, quite a bleak picture uh, to start with uh, and maybe to almost kind of enhance the doom and gloom, I suppose. The next trend is uh, the increasing complexity within customer experience and kind of customer service operations. What can you, yeah, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, it comes back to the fact that everything that we're trying to achieve now is to make experiences better, right? Like um, the boom of creating shop systems is over in e-commerce, the boom of creating easy, accessible apps for your finance, um, personal finances is over. Those things are set in stone, right? Now it's about taking the existing processes and experiences and making them more accessible to your customers when it comes to problems, right? Um, and 
I think the problem we face here is we have a lot of complexity that we're facing from the past because basically no company will start Greenfield except it's a startup and it's going to scale quickly, right? Every big company that has a heavy B2C customer relationship um, history um, will start Brownfield and have plenty, plenty of um, different systems in their landscape that have to be integrated, that have to talk to each other, right? And those systems are not all at the same state of technology. So it's really hard to harmonize this entire orchestration of processes to deliver one singular fantastic experience to the customer. And I think that's really why the complexity is such a crucial part of things. And um, I, I think that's actually together with one of the next factors that you're gonna that you're gonna mention uh, the the missing developers in this world it's actually a real burden for companies to deal with because they don't have the tech resources to adapt to that complexity but uh, they have the complexity that they can't um, take away anymore because they rely on it mm. yeah absolutely and I guess the cat's kind of out of the bag as well um, there for our fourth uh, force but I think it leads kind of as you meant as you mentioned it leads very nicely on uh, on from the increasing complexity of customer experience, and that is this developer shortages. What 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 exactly are you seeing there? So you, the problem is, and historically, we we see we we're tracking that problem not only because we're a tech company ourselves that hire developers, but we see it in the market um, over the years that since 2010, basically, um, we have quadrupled the um, necessity of um, deep tech developers to deal with the kind of technology that we're de delivering in the top end of the market, right? And um, if we can't even find people to do that, it's really hard to find people in bigger organizations, enterprises, to clean up all the old stuff that has been built or bought or built and bought um, to, to then, you know, manufacture better better system landscapes. And that's a huge, huge, huge um, blocker for any um, customer service department in, in our particular case. And I tell you why, because customer service shifted very heavily from we're operating a call center to we now have omni-channel customer service across all digital channels um, orchestrated together with a voice channel. And the big problem here is not that um, we can't operate one, every single channel. The problem is, again, the complexity I've already talked about combined with the fact that you need technical folks to um, deliver the projects. And um, a technical person in a contact center is not someone who knows how to build a process on a Miro or on a whiteboard, right? A technical person in a contact center has to deal with like super complex network issues of your telephone carrier, deep code um, infrastructure, stuff that is not necessarily um, in the development course from an agent to a contact center leader who is actually close to the customer service processes. So there's a huge gap between those missing developers and those customer service leaders that are really, really good in understanding their customer, but are, are really bad in coding normally from their yeah. background. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I suppose there is kind of one sort of knight in shining armor here that's maybe more composable uh, customer service uh, and experience platform. But I'll put a, I'll put a pin in that one um, for now and uh, quickly kind of move on um, to the next uh, next force, and that is the agent crunch, is how you've uh, phrased us. What can you tell us about this uh, agent crunch? Yeah, um, so this is really, really um, interesting because I don't think call center um, providers or people that operate a call center have, would have ever thought that they wouldn't find people to operate their call center. Technology is one thing, right? Technology is expensive, investments are high, you have to prove an ROI to get in there. But now not finding people to deal with problems is actually the agent crunch that we're experiencing, especially since the pandemic um, um, in 2020, um, when people were really heavily being laid off and weren't able to um, necessarily work in their contact centers. That was due to, by the way, missing technology that would enable them to work remotely. Um, heavily, right? Um, a lot of them uh, left because of that reason. Um, we really have seen a shift in in skills. People now experience that other areas of work 
right, where you can be caring and, and empathetic are um, also open for you to to work and be better paid. The contact center business, and we all know that, is a very, very cookie cutter business. It's all about very small margins. Salaries in, in the beginning and the operational level are unnecessarily high, right? You really have to have a passion for helping people to actually um, supersede your positions from time to time to make a career. And that was, was really, really hard in the past. And people just shifted away from contact centers because they said, why, why am I dealing with the problems of people all day for really bad pay? Right. I'm not being helped by technology. I'm not being helped by great processes. I'm like the bottleneck. Uh, why not being paid at least the same somewhere else and then move away? And now reality is that managers really struggle to find customer service agents, customer service specialists in um, a given field to deliver um, those high expectations customers have in the first place that we've already talked about. Mm. Yeah, and I guess... A lot of people would kind of argue to that, oh, we have these kind of new co-pilots that are coming that will support agents, maybe take a lot of their workload away and and sort of mitigate that trend, uh, perhaps. But I guess in practice, it's maybe not so, it's not as easy as that and change doesn't happen. Uh, uh, absolutely, uh, yeah. I mean, um, let me let me come in here, Charlie, quickly on the on the co-pilot topic. I think co-pilots are great, and, and technology will do a lot. And our last point we're going to talk about, obviously, is is the is the um, game changer in, in any industry at the moment. But besides those factors, you still need humans that are interested in interaction, problematic interaction, right? And no co-pilot in the world will put a smile on your face. No co-pilot in the world will help a customer being. Um, uh, you know, like herd, for example, we're dealing with um, huge enterprise organizations ourselves at Balfour's, and we see um, a lot that you know you, you can tell if people smile on the other end of the phone when when they take the call, and um, if you deal with these enterprise organizations that have sometimes very emotional topics to deal with, for example, loss, right, um, financial loss, personal loss, um, insurances, banks. Those companies tend to underestimate the human touch that is necessary to create great experiences. And that's not solved by any co-pilot, um, any AI application or anything that you would put out there on technology. So, you know, for us, our goal is always to figure out, okay, how can we help the human being more human through better processes and easier accessible information? And I think that is really key. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose there does need to be that base layer as well as, as you know, Babel Force will come in, kind of organize the data to ensure this AI will work as planned. And a lot of contact centers are very far away from <laughs> that sort of reality too. Um, but yeah, you did kind of uh, give a nod to it then. We are going to talk as a, for our final force, you know, you hear about it everywhere now, AI innovation and hype. What more can you maybe tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, um... AI for us at Babelfoys is a hygiene factor. It's a tool, but it's not center product, the thing that we do, right? We, we, we set out to build a platform to help people to compose better CX processes, uh, customer service processes on the voice channel. And um, AI helps us doing that. But AI is not our selling argument, right? Anyone who, who, who is serious about their product or their business will use AI anyways. But it's it's we have bigger fish to fry. And that was also a little bit the the entirety of my my little uh, presentation, right? And um, that's also like binding it out. Um, AI is not the biggest problem customer service centers uh, are currently facing. Right. The other forces are actually stronger. They're not as hyped or as sexy or as cool as uh, maybe AI applications. But honestly, like I'd be more worried about my complexity that can't be solved by developers and me not having agents during a time where we're heading towards recession than, oh, can I, can I use AI? Yeah, honestly, like I've had meetings where well-educated contact center managers or CTOs even said, I want to use AI and um, said that's an IT requirement for them. And, you know, we, we've came to that point where the hype is overruling uh, logical thought. And I think that's really dangerous because um, it won't help you. Like it will help you for little symptoms of the problem, but it won't really um, get to the root cause of it. And I think that's really where, where we have to be careful that yes, AI is a tool, um, but AI is not the solution 
the golden solution to any problem in contact centers. Hmm. Yeah, and I think it's interesting, you know, a lot of vendors will come on here and they'll talk to me about all the promise um, of AI and kind of maybe a bulk up, bolster that hype. Um, and you're kind of taking a different angles saying kind of make sure your processes are in place first, compose those processes with more, uh, with more guile, I suppose. Um, what's, is that the message that you uh, maybe want to share from all of these six forces or what's kind of the key message that you want to put out into the customer experience space now after going through each of those? Yeah. I mean, this is now the hook that I've also put into my presentation, right? Um, everyone that listened carefully um, noticed that we've only talked about five forces so far, like named five forces, but we said it's six forces. And what is the sixth force? And I think this is the this is the crucial point. Like it's, and I, I really want to pin it to everyone involved in this discussion. Um, it's actually the managers out there. The sixth force shaping the contact centers of tomorrow aren't us vendors or technology it's the managers that have to be count like be hold accountable by themselves especially to deliver the promises they put out to um, their teams to their customers and a lot of managers really forget that it's not their way that is the best it's the way the customer thinks it's the best. And we have so many tiers between technology towards the end customer, right? The, the paying customer, that managers in between forget that it's not the best how they think it is. It's not the best how they think it's most efficient for their organization. It's the best for the customer that pays their product and hence keeps their company alive. So I think the sixth force, and this is really the, the most important one, and that's my core message, is all these five factors that we've discussed in detail combined, but the manager that keeps himself accountable um, to changing whatever you know they really want to achieve by accepting those five forces and then navigating into the future um, through change. And I think that's really the core message here. You, you can't be successful if you're not willing to change and you can't be successful if you don't put your customer first and customer service. I mean, that's the, the big pain everyone of our industry, I think, dreams um, nights about, right? Is that gap between what I think is right and what my customer thinks is right and what I think is customer centricity and what my customer thinks customer centricity looks like. So I think that's really the gap to close. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, as you mentioned, a really nice message uh, to close on. But I think it's been a great um, chat. So thank you very much uh, for joining me uh, today, uh, Julian. Thanks, Charlie, for having me. It's uh, been fun. And um, yeah, I mean, hopefully uh, we'll have great conversations with um, people that follow us about that topic, because I think it's really something uh, we should consider for 2024 to be a core a core. Um, value or understanding or concept that you can take with into the future. I think that's that's really that's really where we want to end. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And what I will do actually for everybody uh, that wants to dig in and find more, I'll add a couple of links into the description box um, below as well uh, to the Verbal Force website. Uh, but yeah, thanks again, um, Julian. Great conversation. And um, yeah, thanks every to everybody for watching uh, too. Bye for now.